I'm Penny Harvey, one of the um, press directors from Manchester, and I'm very pleased to introduce you tonight to um, Dr. Morris Glassman, Lord Glassman, a labour life here, and also a reader in political theory at London Metropolitan University. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, Morris has worked, um, his research interests are really in the relationship between citizenship and faith and the limits of the market. He's also director of the Faith and Citizenship um, program. And um, the period seems to, from looking at all the information I'm finding out in, that has grown very directly out of his 10 years that he worked with London Citizen, which is an alliance of community organisations in London, of faith groups, student organisations, and um, union branches. And through this work, um, got very much involved with the current Labour Party in trying to kind of find ways of revitalising Britain, not just the Labour Party, but Britain as well, coining the term Blue Labour, which then immediately became wonderfully controversial in the press. But as I understand it, um, looking for new ways to broker the common good and making strategic alliances in order to do that, which has sometimes been quite controversial. And so we're hoping today that some of this controversy will come up in his talk and we'll be able to talk about it. Um, so Morris is going to talk for half an hour or so, and then we have two um, respondents from within press. Um, professor Carol Williams, who is a professor um, at Manchester Business School and is also our press convening director at the moment. Um, Carol is currently working with a very energetic research team on issues of financialisation, banking and financial sector, among other things. Um, and they're writing about financialization and strategy, financialization at work, and they wrote a very influential alternative banking report. So he's coming at the talk from that angle. And we also have Gillian Evans, who's um, also at Manchester, a press research fellow and social anthropologist. Her first book was on, um, on the post-industrial Docklands in southeast London, um, called Educational Failure, Working Class and White Children in Britain. And she's also now just got a new project which is nearing completion, um, which is on the planning and delivery of the Olympic legacy in that same area of post-industrial East End of London. So Dylan is going to bring some discussion of class issues to, to our debate today. So the way we're going to run this is, first of all, Morris will speak two short replies, and then probably just five or ten minutes for questions from the floor, and then we can go and have a drink, or go and watch the England game, but you have to stay till the end of the talk first. Thank you very much, Morris. Good afternoon, and um, it's, a, it's a great honour to give the Cresc annual lecture uh, this year. I'd say the work of Cresc has been an inspiration to all of us who have tried to stitch together the political position that has become known as, as Blue Labour. Um, and it's a position that works with paradox, and one of the themes I'd like to develop tonight is that it's difficult to strike the right balance between being stubborn and being open. Um, through the political failure of the left to resist Thatcherism and then the grim accommodation of New Labour, it was very hard to stay true to the insight that something bad was going on and at the same time overcome the limits of failed progressive paradigms and articulate something more politically appealing and economically plausible. All of Presque um, had to be stubborn in maintaining a sustained objection to the impoverishment and humiliation of working people by the power elites of the market and the state, and open in finding an interpretive framework that could best explain the radical nature of the new reality. C. Wright Mills and Andy Haldane make unlikely partners, but the relationship works and has been an inspiration to me. My relationship with Carol, however, didn't get off to such a good start. Uh, Blue Labour did make an appearance in the Cresc literature, but only as an aspect of faddish elitism that gestured to the right problem that could find no means of affecting them. Given the scale and range of attacks on Blue Labour when it came into the world, this was received with a slight pang of disappointment, an emotion very common to academics, rather than grief, but I did wonder how this relationship could be brokered. <laughs> It was with subdued delight, therefore, that I received an email from Carol supporting an argument in a New Statesman article in early January and suggesting a conversation. I had, however, <coughs> one lingering misgiving. For many years, I wrote a very specific genre of literature, which one might call lonely academic, <laughs> in which you are rejected by the mainstream and despised by the alternative. <laughs> Unread and bereft, it is hard to describe such a life as bringing, brimming over with friendship and laughter. The effect of recognising how much unnecessary suffering there is for working people, how superficial and inept our political elites can be, 
how venal our financial elites really are, and how far we are from having a popular expression of hope and disaffection can be debilitating. A certain humorlessness can pervade the heart, and an unrelational superiority that is the very opposite of what the political position requires. It is not called blue labour for nothing. <laughs> Was Carroll going to be a person like that? It was with trepidation and excitement that I approached a distant bearded figure at the entrance of the House of Lords, and as I walked up to Carroll, he smiled at me and said, it really is a load of bollocks, isn't it? And I knew that everything was going to be all right. As the opening line of the public relationship, it may not rival Dr. Livingstone, I presume, but it has stayed with me. We then sat down and had a political conversation, the type of which there is far too few of in Parliament, and the invitation to speak here followed from that. I honour all at Crest for the quality <coughs> and the quantity of your writing. I think it will turn out to be the most important contribution to the new political economy of any academic centre. And there are two distinctively Cresc themes that I have drawn upon in my own work and which will be developed in various ways in this lecture. The first concerns the political power of the City of London and its economic consequences. The alternative banking report not only rightly questioned the claims of the financial sector in terms of job creation and tax revenues, but also the type of internal investment that, financial sector, that the financial sector pursues, which was overwhelmingly in property and loans, and under the debt-based model of growth characterised by subsidised, badly paid jobs. The City of London Corporation is the most ancient continuous democratic commune in the world, and it represents the interests of the financial sector alone, which is the most important economic interest in our polity. And Crest were among the first to understand this causally and in terms of power, a theme I will return to later. <coughs> a sentence from the report which said, quote, the only credible, credible response is radical new economic policies which can usefully be launched through local and regional initiatives is one which has organised my own work and will be developed this evening. The central theme here is financialisation and how it leads to concentrations of ownership and the centralisation of decision making. The second theme is the concern with the failure of leadership and statecraft. After the great complacence introduced me to two new concepts to describe this, the elite debacle and the fiasco. I have tried to work with both ever since. The theme was continued in Groundhog Day, which is my personal favourite. There is also a common interest in the work of Andy Haldane at the Bank of England. My respect for Mr Haldane is profound, and it is necessary that he is part of the conversation that lies ahead of us. Crest drew attention not only to the consequences of financialisation, but also the failure of leadership, which was not personal, but systematic. The crash of 2008 will turn out to be a decisive moment in the emergence of 21st century politics. In its aftermath, there is the need for an articulation of a strategy through which to harness popular disaffection with the power elites and an agenda for economic transformation through a democratic politics of the common good. Blue Labour is an attempt to do that, and tonight I want to particularly emphasise the link between tradition and modernisation between retrieving our inheritance and competing effectively in a global economy, hence the title, An Old Polity for a New Economy. Relationships, power dogs, tradition, power, leadership, institutions, vocation, virtue, reciprocity, I find these words cropping up in unlikely places in the work I do, but before attempting to show how they fit together in the framework, framework of a political strategy, it is necessary to tell a brief story about where we are now as concerns the economy. The story is that the combination of finance capital and public administration, which have been the dominant drivers of employment, employment and growth over the past 30 years, have not generated very much energy or goodness. Of the £1.3 trillion pounds lent by banks in the British economy between 1997 and 2007, 84% was in mortgages and financial services. The practical predicament we confront is that in the combination of household debt and those held by our financial institutions, we are indeed a world leader. And this comparative advantage has been building for a long time. Private indebtedness was the most recent method by which we borrowed against our future to serve the present, and it has reached its limit. There was the inflation in the late 60s, then there was the deficit 
state deficit, then there was the growth beginning with Thatcher of the private debt, and now, miraculously, we have both the deficit and debt. The theoretical predicament is that on their own, neither a Keynesian nor a neoclassical approach has the conceptual means of understanding the importance of institutions, of vocation, virtue and value in generating competitive advantage, reciprocity as the foundation of good practice, and the importance of long-term relationships between capital, labour and place in generating growth and innovation. It sounds like a foreign language, but ethos, virtuosity and leadership are fundamental to a firm success in contemporary capitalism. <clears throat> the ugly economic phrase is value added. The importance of these institutions and practices is the lesson of the comparative strength of the German political economy, which did not pursue a Keynesian model after 1945, but one based on worker representation in firms, a vocational economy, and robust regional banks constrained to lend within the region or the sector. The importance of the body politic as well as of the administrative state is one way of describing this. The renewal of the labour tradition of political economy is another. Labour, which is the tra tradition I work within, was born out of the decimation of the common life of the people by enclosure and the abolition of any status or association <coughs> between non-professional people. The glorious revolution was truly glorious for lawyers, accountants and professional partners. It was not so good for peasants, carpenters and plumbers. The professions were protected in law and retained their status, but the vocations were dissolved into the free labour market. It was through the establishment of the institutions of the labour movement, the burial societies, mutual funds, building societies, combinations as trade unions used to be known, that the people organised themselves and protected their status for being that of a commodity in the economy and an administrative unit of the poor law state. The working poor buried each other in proper graves. They built houses and ensured each other from calamity. The party was radical and conservative, democratic and traditional. <coughs> Labour, and I think a couple of weekends ago we got a kind of reminder of this, was a partner in brokering that most extraordinary of political settlements, the democratic monarchy. The fundamental insight of the Labour tradition is that human beings and nature are not commodities. They were not created as commodities and cannot endure that loss of status due to excessive exploitation and subsequent exhaustion. Capital is committed to securing the highest return on its investment, but the consequences of that, unless mediated by non-market institutions, is ruinous for human beings and their environment. The labour tradition, while brokering a common good not only between Catholic and Protestant, but between secular and religious, is continuous with Christianity and the citizenship tradition in asserting that the value of a person is not exclusively defined by their price. The best way to resist both exploitation by the market as well as oppression by the state is through democratic association built around locational, locational and vocational institutions. In terms of specifically press categories, I am suggesting adding commodification to financialization as a core concept. If commodification is understood as the transformation of that which was not produced as a commodity, <coughs> human beings, nature, to give you two rather large examples, but if, if commodification is the transformation of human beings and nature into commodities with a monetary price in the market, and financialization is understood as the pressure exerted to turn substantive assets into formal money assets, then both concepts are central to the construction of a better theory, and their practical effects need to be resisted in the formation and constitution of countervailing institutions with popular legitimacy, Status and trusts, institutions and endowments are the most effective way of doing this. The tragic paradox of the labour tradition is that while there is no alternative to capitalism, capitalism is no alternative. The politics of blue labour is to recognise that and build institutions and solidarity that can domesticate capital and tame its commodifying and financialising force by building democratic institutions and constraints. This is a long way from the political economy of new labour. The assumption that globalisation required transferable skills and not vocational speciality, that traditional local practice were to be superseded by rationalised administration and production, was mistaken. The denuding of the country and its people of their institutional and productive inheritance by the higher rates of return found in the City of London 
and then the vulnerability of those gains to speculative loss is the story we confronted in 2008 and is well told in the Crest report. It turns out that the German political economy, with its federal republic and subsidiarity, with its works councils and co-determination between capital and labour, with its regional and local banks and vocational control of labour market entry, with its distinctive stress on place, of democracy, locational and vocational, was much better equipped to deal with globalisation than we were with our financial services and transferable skills. The institutional settlement of post-war West Germany has endured because it generated value. They retained pre-modern artisan organisations and turned them into the foundation of their contemporary economic success. They entangled and constrained capital in a myriad form of national, sectoral and localised arrangements and they emerged from the crash virtually alone with a productive economy and a functioning democracy with greater equality than us and more meaningful work. They have retained ideas of status that we discarded in, in favour of flexible labour markets, and yet they proved better at adapting to the change in circumstances generated by new technology and financial innovations. They asserted that globalisation was not a fate that required a simple response, and that was the teething conception of internal goods, of internal negotiation and cooperation, of a balance of interest within a corporation and not an exclusive assertion of external ownership, a unilateral managerial prerogative characterised a system built upon strong self-organised democratic institutions within the economy. The comparative superiority of the social market economy is an important feature of the new political economy. Blue Labour is considered to be at its most fanciful when talking about the revival of Tudor statecraft and the Commonwealth tradition. However, the move away from policies and programmes towards institutions and the common good requires this. In 1500, England was behind in maths and science, literature, munitions, naval technology and theology. King's and Trinity College were established in Cambridge with endowed chairs in maths, Greek, Hebrew and science. The Greenwich Maritime College was established along with the Woolwich Arsenal, about which I have very mixed feelings. The Royal Exchange was established in London <coughs> as an alternative to Amsterdam as a clearinghouse for global trade. The gold captured from the Golden Hind formed the foundation of the gold standard and the exchequer. Within a hundred years, our ships ruled the waves, the King James Bible established English as a literary language, London was the undisputed emporium for currency and the emerging Atlantic trade. Bonfire light indicated that when it came to gunpowder and munitions, we had enough to feed the needy and there was an institutional body politic capable of underpinning state policy and prosperity. England was in a very different position in 1600 to 1500, and inst an institutional endowment was a key part of it. I think we are in a similar position now, where long-term institutional design and reimagining of body politic are necessary in order to reconstitute our nation as a free and democratic one, with distinctive traditions and practices that are a blessing to ourselves and to the world. New Labour is based upon the assumption that we are living at a time that the ancient Greeks used to call a kairos moment, a time of a challenging of orthodoxies that requires decisive political leadership and a change of direction. This form of statecraft is consistent with our national traditions and combines the establishment of new economic institutions within a framework of decentralised democracy and a more durable body politic. This requires not only that we can tell a different story about our successes and failures, about where we have gone wrong so that we can do better, but also that we can tell it within the understanding and experience of our fellow citizens. Aristotle spoke of doxa, of working within the experiences and meanings of everyday life. Blue Labour is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition, and as with its predecessor associated with the Tudor Commonwealth men, it allied that with the freeborn tradition of English liberty. It is as synthetic as the myriad peoples who have lived here and live here. So what are the forms of the new economy that are linked to the ancient polity? How can an embedded institutional system be brokered from the materials that we inherit and have to work with now? How can we move from the world as it is to the world as it should be? The first move I would suggest is to establish new banking institutions in the places where people live and would like to work, which can address the fundamental problem of lack of internal investment. The stranglehold of the city on our pension funds, savings and assets, and the relentless recklessness of the money managers who were their custodians proved calamitous.
constraining banks to lend within specific places to establish productive and profitable relationships with businesses that function in those places is necessary in order to break the illusory speculative rule of higher returns on investment. Best value intensified the pressure. A very blunt way of putting all this is that for all that mayhem about public and private partnership, there simply wasn't enough private sector growth, enough business growth over the last 15 years. I am inspired by the excellent work of Andy Haldane has mentioned at the Bank of England, and he has gone furthest in probing the causes of systematic, unaccountable recklessness in the banking sector. I would suggest that we use 5% of the bailout money to endow the banks of England, which could be established in the counties and cities of England, and would be constrained to lend within the county or city. The principle of the endowment would be in trust to the people of that county or city, in perpetuity so that it could not be liquidated by its members and the balance of power in its corporate governance would be held by a third by the Bank of England, a third by its workforce and a third by the civic institutions of the locality. These newly constituted banks of England are one of the essential features of blue labour statecraft built upon endowment and institution building. Without the endowment of newly constituted banks with a locational constraint, the story of the Northern County's Permanent Building Society, established in 1850, and its tragic transformation into Northern Rock, will be repeated and generalised within an increasingly financialised economy. There are always short-term rational reasons for improving returns by easing lending constraints, but the result is invariably unreasonable. The Cooperative Bank had a policy of relational banking, based on local relationships with business, and it had half a percent of the toxic debt found in the mainstream banks in 2008. This government has failed to establish these new institutions in the regional economy, and given quantitative easing and targeted stimulus packages, that is its greatest failure. It is using failed institutions as its <coughs> instrument for growth, and the trend is continuing. It is a telling statistic that there are nine effective lending banks in Britain, and I gave up counting when I got to 3,000 in Germany. Learning from local failure within a decentralised system is different from the centralised fiasco of the banking bailout. The lack of capital in the regions requires not simply the establishment of one big industrial bank, but regional banks and sectoral banks that can build long-term relationships with local firms and their specific needs. Both finance and state administration have a tendency to centralisation. The building of locally endowed financial trusts recognises and resists this. There are strong traditions of local and mutual financial institutions in the regions of England, but they have been largely eviscerated over the last 40 years. Their revitalisation is a central aspect of the work ahead. All the demutualised building societies and banks from the 80s have been bought out, and on July the 5th I'm speaking at the launch of a campaign to re-mutualise the Halifax in Halifax. I hope to speak at seven events in Bradford and Woolwich. It is perhaps too late to relocate Arsenal back into their South London home, but I will raise the issue. <laughs> the embedding of the economy in an institutional system is one way of conceptualising this. It is, however, only half the story. There needs to be a renewal <coughs> of, me, of political institutions and a confrontation with power elites whose lobbying and institutional power is a key fault line in our political settlement. Central to this is the power of finance within the state. Let's take my city, this city, London. Rather, it is not a city, but an authority. The city of London Corporation, the most ancient continuous democratic city in the world, Milton's Mansion House of Liberty, with its common council, guilds, livery companies, aldermen and men, with its remembrancer and sheriffs, is in contrast a supremely well-endowed lobbyist for the financial sector. It is an important reality to recognise that our greatest civic inheritance represents only the interests of money. It has, it has 150 democratically elected representatives, while London as a great authority representing 8 million people has one elected mayor and an ill-defined council of 24. London, which more than any other city has had to experience relentless population churn, institutional disruption and deindustrialization, meanwhile has the greatest need of a sense of place, of a common life. An example of blue labour statecraft would be to extend the City of London Corporation to all of London, so that the Mayor of London can live in the Mansion House, which will save Boris some money on his alumni and all that. That each locality in London can be represented in its Parliament in the Guildhall, and the livery 
three companies of bakers, plumbers, merchant adventurers and carpenters are no longer dining clubs for bankers, but actively renew the promotion of the vocational economy, which they were established to do. London was established as a commune in 1191. Its civic retrieval would be an important step towards blocking the domination of single interest and renewing citizenship as a powerful practice. That is what New Labour means by radical traditionalism, the way we construct our democratic destiny out of our civic inheritance, part of the virtue through which we confront Fortuna, to take a trope from Machiavelli. The establishment of local banks and city parliaments work together to generate a politics of the common good, a redistribution of power, and a challenge to the domination of policy by the financial interest. I would argue for the establishment of unitary city parliaments in all our major cities. The entire population of Scotland could fit into North London and all of Wales into South London with something to spare, and yet we fret over our national settlement. Of far more importance is the establishment and linking of institutional power for capital and citizens in a new framework of democratic cities and counties. That is one meaning of the Labour Commonwealth. A second example of an ancient polity for a new economy concerns the status of work, our lack of regard for skill and the conditions of its preservation and dissemination. The word I have chosen to summarise this is an ancient and a modern one, that of vocation. The endowment of vocational institutions and the establishment of the vocational economy is central to the generation of an economy built upon value. The key link that needs to be made is between the national skill formation regime, forgive my language, and the organisation of the labour market. In the professional economy, it is illegal to practice without having served a long period of training and apprenticeship. Doctors, lawyers and dentists have self-organised institutions that function as an interest group and an internal ethical regulator that controls labour market entry. They used to be called guilds. This was generalised across skill formation and labour market entry throughout all trades in Germany. A democratically organised artisan skill sector constantly renewed its skills, and this worked as a constraint across the entire economy and provided the tradition within which innovation could make sense in terms of good practice. A move away from university education as the exclusive goal and towards a system that honours work by hand and brain and renews a sense of virtue within the craft, enforced and sustained by organisations, is one consequence of pursuing value. This would require a reorganisation and reorientation of higher education. One path could be to restore the ex-polytechnics as vocational colleges and establish a co-government system within them between unions, the private sector and the state. One could think of placing the medical schools and the law schools within them so that the class distinction is dissolved. It also requires an intensification of the union direction pioneered by union loan, in which the union partners vocational training. The government makes no link between apprenticeship and labour market entry, and their skills agenda thus lacks institutional force. But who speaks for skill, for expertise, for tradition, in the swath of interest that I sometimes survey in the atrium of poor Cullis House? The vocational economy needs to be linked to the renewal of the ancient polity. This relates to the reform of the institution I am now a member of, the House of Lords. The idea proposed by the government of a mirror of the House of Commons called a Senate, elected by proportional representation and serving 15-year terms, is not, I think, a very good one. The Lords is really an extraordinary place. The hereditary peers are democratically elected. There are people there with genuine distinction in their careers in business, academia, medicine, church, as well as politics. There are moments listening to the debates when I am genuinely moved by the experience that is brought to bear on the issue. Legislation is very properly amended and revised, and a certain breathtaking civility characterises conversation between parties and more eerily within them. The number of working class peers on our benches outnumbers those in the Commons, so obviously it has to go. I would suggest that the Commons is best understood as a democracy location, where people are elected from the places where they live. The country emphatically rejected losing that link last year. The Lords, in contrast, should represent vocational democracy, where people are elected from their working lives. There should be people elected from their sector, whether that be electrical or academic medical or administrative. The vice-chancellors should elect a lord, and so should academics. The elected lords of the head of hospitals, as well as nurses and cleaners, should be there. 
There should be a minimum age limit of 50 so that people involved are experienced and are recognised by their peers as embodying virtue. That combination of experience and expertise that comes with practice. There should be elected representatives not only of the Church of England but of all significant denominations, Catholic as well as Muslim. I would return the judges to the chamber so that it is the final court of appeal and the apex of the common law in Parliament. The English tradition is based upon the balance of power, not the separation of the powers, but that should be pursued in the polity as well as the firm. The vocational chamber would revise and amend legislation as it does now, but on the basis of the judgment of people who actually know what they are talking about, or are recognised as experts in their field by their peers in democratic election. It has been the greatest honour and privilege of my life to sit in Parliament. Each day my heart is full of wonder that such a thing could be true, and I have probably enjoyed myself too much, and I recognise that. And I recognise that I will not win election to such a distinguished house, and would not deserve to. This form of constitutional and institutional renewal serves modern demands within the constraints of a meaningful tradition. Above all, such an arrangement would ensure that the working life of the country is represented in Parliament. In a renewed vocational system, the Queen would be the custodian of the vocational tradition, and looking ahead, it is certainly a job that Prince Charles could do quite well. The creation of local banking and the strengthening of city councils, the protection of status of work and House of Lords reform goes back to the birth of the Labour movement, as does the third area of institutional change, which concerns the use of endowment and trusts to promote land reform and house building. <coughs> I'm fond of saying at Labour Party meetings that within three weeks of the normal compress, 90% of the freehold property in England was owned by 12 French nobles, and it's been pretty much uphill ever since. <laughs> there is £10 million worth of land being sold off by the government in parallel to the cuts. There are many reasons for thinking that this is the most fruitful area of resistance by Labour. The sale of the forests and allotments was opposed in the first. The further reason is that taking away the freehold cost halves the price of the property of building a home. In terms of community land trusts, which could be endowed by the state or local authority in perpetuity for the people of that place in trust for the nation, it would enable leasehold house building within a shared freehold structure. Community land trusts were pursued with extraordinary results in East Brooklyn by the Industrial Areas Foundation in the building of Nehemiah homes. Without freehold costs, house building would become affordable, local skills developed, and the redistribution of land and assets, both individually and shared, to people who are dispossessed. The Great Recession, as Wolfgang Streck calls it, is most morose in the construction sector. The endowment of the land to the people would be one form of stimulus, and it could make the generation of the money necessary for house building possible. This use of community land trusts is not only applicable to housing, but to public assets. Dover Port, for example, is owned by the government and leased to Dover Port Authority, which is now a private company, and they wish to sell it to another private authority as a freehold entity. This is part of the portfolio rationalisation made necessary by the deficit. The highest bidder at the moment is a French company. One of the features of commodification is that it severs meaning from price. Dover Port is a lot of things, but French is certainly not one of them. In contrast, Dover Port could be endowed to the people of Dover in perpetuity for the nation as a community land trust and could be governed on the corporate model of a third funders, third workers and a third of the people of Dover. Their vocational college could specialise in travel, maritime training, motor based and could be funded partly by the Kent County, County, County Bank and by union pensions funds, as in the restructuring of Chrysler in Detroit, thus bringing all aspects of this system together regional banks, vocational colleges, work and civic representation in governments, the use of trusts and endowment, and, a, and an audacious and populist local politics are all embodied in Dover Port. The White Cliffs may yet again represent defiance and hope for the working people of England. As it stands, the citizens of Dover are tenant farmers in their own city. This is an example of where a populist politics is in alliance with the new economy through the restoration of an ancient city. Three paradoxes have organised this lecture. The first has been the suggestion that globalisation requires a national institutional regime. The second is that this is best conceived in a decentralised form that would challenge the primacy of the Treasury in favour of regional variety and power. The third is that the generation of the new economy and the renewal of our ancient polity are linked. 
the recapitalization of the regions through the endowment of new banks of England can only be achieved if the City of London Corporation is retrieved by the citizens of London from its capture by the financial sector. The establishment of the vocational economy by the restoration of the House of Lords as a vocational chamber. The establishment of community land trusts to redistribute land and housing is linked to the civic and economic renewal of one of our most ancient and iconic courts. Prest have spoken mournfully about the disconnect between elite institutions and democratic politics. The price of a successful political action is a constructive alternative, and I have tried to present one this evening. There is much more to say, and you can't imagine the self-discipline involved in not saying it. <laughs> but I am aware that I have already spoken for too long, and I would like to thank Press again for the work that you do and for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture. Thank you. I can speak from this desk, I think that's probably the issue. Um, I think it was very nice. Boris was exceedingly kind to talk about the overlap between the Labour and the press. Or at least, because press is many different things, that part of press which works on financial crisis in economic renewal. Um, and the two points I wanted to make were that I think if you look at the overlap between press and the Labour, there's a fundamental political agreement, but there's also a significant technical difference about implementing the project. The fundamental agreement is on the political project about the common good. And we agree about putting the polity back into the economy, whereas Thatcher and Blair through utility privatization, selling council houses, putting interest rates with an independent bank, were all about taking things out I think that's very important. We agree about the need to reinvent representative democracy. I think Morris is quite properly concerned with the hollowed out mass parties, Westminster, the cliques, and all the rest of that. And Cresc owes a lot on those arguments, I think, to the force of Mick Moran's point of view. But we've also learned a lot from Morris's work, particularly his pioneering critique the corporation in the city of London. But let me come now to the friendly disagreement about the technical difficulty. Um, and really, what I wanted to say here comes very much out of our experience in the past 30 years with this kind of affair with mainstream economics and trying to perform it in the real world. The point I wanted to say was simply that simple knowledge formally do not reliably format a complex world. And certainly, they don't do this in a world which is full of clever and cynical actors, and a world which is infested by powerful interests. Now, there are lots of ways in which that theme can be tracked through Cress work, particularly in the idea that regulation in finance was not an external constraint, but an input for the Greek large within the sector. It was because of Basel II that people shifted things off balance sheet. But I think there are lots of ways in which that particular difficulty about the complexity of the world and the difficulty of formatting it and, and dividing sheep from goats emerges in Morris's own argument tonight. Like, I mean, I think we are both agreed that Andy Haldane is the closest to this country produces to a public service intellectual in the Beveridge and Keynes tradition, rather than the kind of self-promoting public intellectuals like unpleasantly for the lecture. Um, when, when that's said and done, it's really extraordinarily interesting, because the Bank of England is a, is a reactionary institution that provides, presides <coughs> over a system of bank welfare. Yeah. Most recently, 140 million to the banks last week, mm -hmm. um, which propped the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the Bank of England employs Andy Haldane as director of financial stability. It's very paradoxical. One could make much the same point about Morris's treatment of the German case, where it seems to me partly that institutions support performance, but it's also the case that performance outcomes support extraordinarily less institutions. The point I'm making, I think, and emerges very strongly in 
press gardens is that performativity didn't work for the Chicago school in Chile. It didn't work for black shows in the financial markets, and it work, won't work for the followers of Karl Polanyi in the English regions. Um, if you want to, to look at it in a sense, I think one of the major issues is we could kill off Barclays and Lions. And I really do believe in killing off these high street oligopolies with their connections to the financial markets. And you could end up with a connection of local and regional banks who were all rather like the Spanish Kayas, in hoc to local politics and heavily um, uh, responsible for funding a property boom. Now, I think that kind of danger is not a reason for persevering with the centralized state, but it is something that needs to be taken into account when one is thinking about how one decentralizes and regionalizes and localizes the present British system. And I would make a suggestion for, if you like, bridging the gap, which probably isn't a huge one, because I know Morris works with the world and on economics and things of that sort. And it's partly a difference of emphasis, because Kresk has been concerned with sector-specific analysis, and Morris has been more concerned with the programmatic and the general. But I think one of the ways in which you could build, bridge the gap is to expand Morris's idea of vocation and skill, and very much more clearly connect it with ideas of expertise from the kind of science and technology studies kind of area. That expertise is necessary to our society, but at the same time it's dangerous because it's blinkered. And that monopolies of expertise where social interests differ are extraordinarily dangerous. And that would, I think, actually open up all kinds of interesting ways of thinking about what kinds of expertise we have, we don't have, the right kind of expertise, the wrong kind of expertise. And I think it's very interesting from this point of view that if you go back not to Thatcher, which is what most people want to go back to, but to the earlier failed attempt at modernization, the Heath Wilson attempt, that came unstuck because we had a civil service that was both reactionary and couldn't engage with sector specificness in formulating policy. And we had a private sector management which was managing its way to decline by following financial formula. It is rather sad to think that if you think of those two absences of expertise, we don't seem to have fixed very much in the intervening 50 years. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you, Morris, for your provocation, which I take to be a Polanyan meditation. Um, and I've just got three uh, brief points to make in my five minutes. The first is the question of looking to an ancient polity for inspiration. Um, I must say, when I received your uh, draft lecture, I was gobsmacked to discover that by ancient polity you meant Tudor statecraft. Um, I had imagined that by ancient polity you were thinking of um, what contemporary anthropologists are thinking in their analysis of the financial crisis, that they're turning for inspiration to anthropological analyses of gift economies. Um, for example, Keith Hart, Keith Gregory and so on. And their basic analysis is that the only excuse for wealth, uh, wealth accumulation in a gift economy is the capacity it generates for a distributed generosity and creation of the common good. And I take, there's lots of crossover in your lecture with regard to the question of what then constitutes what it is that we want to do when we domesticate either commodity or captive flow, um, what it is we want to do when we give gifts, um, which you call endowments, let's say. Um, and. Um, Maybe what was missing is what we expect in return for the gift, what counts in citizenship as a, as a mutual obligation. So that's just my gobsmacked about the ancient polity. 
Um, the second thing is to just draw your attention to another strand of Kresk uh, research in which um, anthropological analysis of post-industrial urban Britain and to bring it to um, your Aristotelian doxa in which anthropologists are preoccupied exactly with this question of the meaning and experience of everyday life. And the anthropological analyses of post-industrial Britain that we've published recently in 2012 um, show that actually what's most fascinating on the ground uh, in post-industrial, formerly predominantly working class neighbourhoods, is precisely not, is precisely that people on the ground are not preoccupied with their shared economic and social conditions, what they're politically passionate about and in an everyday obsessed about is cultural difference. And I would suggest that this is as significant for the politics of 21st century Britain as the financial crisis. <coughs> and um, that this means that what I would want to add to your core concerns with financialization and quantification are two other core concerns or core challenges about 21st century politics in Britain. The first is the middle classification of Britain, which has happened and which means, okay, so let's just say the middle classification of Britain and then the ethnicization of the working class. And the two things, in fact, are the other side of the financialization coin. And that the bifurcation of middle classification and ethnicization are really the sort of the, the two ways forward for different uh, kinds of working class uh, people in Britain. Middle classification via individual aspiration and social mobility for those who can afford it, in other words, those who bought into the new labour project, and the other, those who couldn't afford that option, ethnicization of the working class, either as the white working class or as a black and Asian working class which doesn't call itself as such. And that the principal failure of labour leadership, I would argue, of the last 30 years has been the failure to navigate a course towards a multiracial common ground. And that's the singular failure alongside um, giving into financialization. And that to do one without the other doesn't capture the um, the what's happening on the ground and what, how people are making sense of things. And I think the alternative to that, as we saw, although I'm proud to say that it's been crushed in the UK, although it's rampant elsewhere, is a common ground in which political collectivisation takes the form of racial and cultural nationalism. And that's a catastrophe for all of us. So we can't afford to ignore these other core challenges. Thanks. So we've got just over five minutes. Would you like to respond to any of those comments? Yes. <laughs> um, first of all, to, to, to Carol's, you know, just to begin the conversation in a, in a public way. So all systems are a means of reducing complexity. This is complexity in itself is is is, is not so issue. So all I'm suggesting really in terms of our bridging is I think it's it's a lot closer than you think. The two areas that I'll, I'll talk about are first of all, which I didn't really stress in this lecture because I couldn't link it to a major political theme, which was the corporate of governance, the work of representation or representation of expertise and the strategic development of the firm. That the that the regulation of, of capital cannot go on at arm's length. It has to be domesticated at source. And so there are two institutions. The first is within the specific firm, within the public sector institution. One of the, and this relates to, to Jill's point very much, one of the key aspects of it was the elimination of, of any representation of working of the people who worked. It was entirely managerial and externally driven in form. So the, the way that I'm suggesting is that, is that is that only the people who work in a specific place have the understanding of the complexity and the expertise required to hold the managers to account. What we had was unilateral sovereignty. I mean, I think Minsky's very good on this in relation to the money managers 
kind of way that they worked outside Walker. It was the breakdown of the shareholder system of external constraints, but no understanding of the internal complexity and the reality. So the combination of corporate governance reform and then the building of very specific expertise in the vocational training system is this is, you know, and, the, and all of this is characterized, which I didn't go into at all, by tension and cooperation at all levels. There's constantly has to be um, those those tensions. So um, I think I think in terms of what I've understood um, of the point you're making, I, I think that's where that's where the um, that's where the expertise has to come in. And the expertise has to be recognised within the corporate structure of things, both institutionally through vocational institutions and specifically personally by the people who actually do the work. And what what the data suggests is that where there is actually a relationship between capital workforce and locality, um, the actual there's, there's far greater negotiated equality than the external imposition of that. So there's a certain trust to the to the reformation of the relation of politics. Um, plenty more. Now, um, Jill, obviously, this was very specific. I've, I've got into massive amounts of trouble on the cultural. That's a whole like, but you notice I was very kind to myself. <coughs> that was your I was even kinder to myself. I avoided the welfare reform. I avoided that whole. But this is this is simple. so. Just to say, in terms of the <coughs> in terms of the methodology, there's a huge um, relation work to the gift economy. That's that that's fundamental. And when you say what is the reciprocity, is the organising principle of the gift economy. And what is not reciprocal is that you give things to people and they don't give anything back. Mm -hmm. That's the hard core of the critique of. Welfare determinism, breakdown of responsibility, family life, and other things. So, the, so this endowment is an aspect of gift, but all aspects of social exchange between classes and within localities are to be conceptualised. And if you don't return the gift, if you don't, if you're not reciprocal in that manner, that's where that's where the, that's where the hard edges of this system lie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I haven't really gone away from that in, in other places, but this. This was specifically, but just to say, like, completely, and I would love to engage in. I mean, there's a whole load of work going on yeah. um, around that, and, and, and that's extreme. But the real, the real sort of concept that wasn't really developed today is that reciprocity is the core feature, not just between individuals, but between institutions. Mm -hmm. Then to go on, um, I like your middle classification. It's, um, it's, it's really little strand as well mm -hmm. that can be developed usefully. I mean, one thing that I that I bring to bear is that where there's what we call and um, the white working class is virtually institutional. So, um, this is what we found in our systems. Couldn't find a way of organising white working class. You know, the pub was one area, but very difficult to get people to remember that they made a commitment to join. Really. Um, and then football clubs was another area where we really tried to found out that the football clubs on the whole hated their fans. Um, and, and that wasn't that relationship was another form of completely reciprocal relationship where the fans gave everything and the club gave virtually nothing. Um, and then the experience is that when it comes to the organisation, um, and, and this was a very hard exchange, I'm trying to get the language right here, about black and Asian communities, it was overwhelmingly in our faith. That there was, that there, so, you know, that, that's a really crucial component of the common good politics. Once again, something I really have written about in more than enough detail in other places, but the engagement of the common good politics where there's not a despising by the secular progressive middle classes of religious people mm -hmm. is a key feature of this common good. And obviously, I mentioned it in my paper, the idea that the human beings are reducible to a commodity is common ground. The idea of forms of reciprocity and responsibility are common ground. As long as you work within an exhibit conception and not a homeland conception mm -hmm. of, of so that's very that you know, that's urban work. So um, so that's where it is really that you know those there's a huge amount of work to do, not spoken of here, in terms of reciprocity and welfare, the reciprocal welfare state. Mm -hmm.
and that addresses these issues in, in, in fundamental contribution. And, and do we move, I mean, one of the ideas worked on over the last couple of years with, with John Thomas is moving from a contractual to a covenantal form of mm -hmm. body politic. Once, once again, much richer language, but much harder edges, much less individual, and, and, and much more time to institutions. Um, plenty more, but, but just to say that that's where I would go as an idea.